This video presents bonus material to the video about the principle of least action. Whereas the first video focused on the ideas and concepts, here the material is presented in such a way that it should be possible to reproduce the results provided that the viewer is familiar with the ideas of calculus and trigonometry. In the first part, the Euler-Lagrange equations are derived, which are a direct consequence of the principle of least action. In the second part, a simple numerical method is described that was used for simulating the motion of the pendulum and the double pendulum. Finally, the kinetic energy for the double pendulum is derived and the equations of motion are presented. All the elements are pieced together and a possible Menem implementation is shown in the end. In the first video, the variational derivative of an action functional is introduced by analogy to calculus. Let's try to shed a little more light on the meaning of a vanishing variational derivative. We have learned that the action functional S is an integral operator that maps every smooth trajectory between the initial and the final state into a real number. Two different trajectories and their values are shown here for the example of the free fall from a height of 5 meters. The red trajectory is realized in nature. It fulfills the requirement that the first derivative of the action for this trajectory vanishes. Similarly to calculus, this derivative is best understood when the difference between two nearby trajectories is considered. Therefore we introduce a perturbation delta x that can be scaled with a parameter epsilon. For simplicity this perturbation is a sine function adjusted in such a way that it vanishes at the initial and final point in time. When this perturbation is added to the trajectories, they are deformed and their values of the action change correspondingly. Next, the difference in the value of the action for the perturbed and unperturbed trajectories are plotted in dependence on the scaling parameter epsilon. It is nice to see that for the non-physical trajectory, the difference grows linearly right from the start, whereas for the physical trajectory, the deviation grows proportional to epsilon square since the linear term vanishes. Now that we've built up some intuition for the variational derivative, let's convert the condition of a vanishing first derivative into a more operational form. Even in the case that it won't be possible for you to follow this derivation, the resulting Euler-Lagrange equation is a very elegant and simple to use tool. So just stick with the following lines of calculation that lead to a very nice recipe. We start with the generic Lagrangian that depends on the position x and its derivative, the velocity. If one wants to express the change in the action in the presence of an added perturbation delta x, the partial derivatives of the Lagrangian have to be multiplied by the perturbation and its time derivative respectively. Now the product rule from calculus can be used to replace the first term of the integral. This procedure is also called integration by parts. By virtue of Stokes' theorem, a boundary term arises, which is zero, however, since the perturbations have to vanish at the initial and final point of time. The initial and final state are supposed to be the same for all trajectories. If we want to achieve that the variation of the action vanishes for all possible perturbations delta x, the Lagrangian has to fulfill the following condition. This is the so-called Euler-Lagrange equation. It is the convenient operational condition that is equivalent to a vanishing first variational derivative. Even if you are not familiar with multivariable calculus, the application of this equation usually doesn't require a lot of skills. Every computer algebra program can do this for you. And in the video description there is a link to a Maple worksheet that calculates the Euler-Lagrange equations for any arbitrary number of linked pendulums. We now can forget all the variational calculus we just can store in the back of our minds that whenever the Euler-Lagrange equation is calculated, one is implicitly looking for the trajectories that are realized in nature and that satisfy the principle of least action. We go back one more time to our simple example of an object that falls from a height of 5 meters. The first part of the Euler-Lagrange equation is the instruction to form the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to h, which only appears linearly in the second term. For the second part, the first derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the velocity is taken. Once this derivative is formed, one has to remember 
that h is actually a time-dependent function. Therefore, the time derivative takes the first derivative of h to its second derivative, denoted with the double dot. Physically, this corresponds to the acceleration. The first and the third line are combined, the masses cancel on each side, and we are left with the statement that the motion is performed with underlying constant acceleration. On the left-hand side of the equation, there is the second derivative of a time-dependent function. Therefore, the time dependence has to be quadratically. Higher powers in t would violate the requirement of constant acceleration. The general solution is a quadratic function with two constants. These two constants are fixed by the boundary conditions that the motion starts at 5 meters and ends at the ground after one second. This yields the unique function that fulfills the principle of least action for the given Lagrangian. It is a nice exercise to repeat the calculations for the pendulum. This time the Lagrangian depends on the angular coordinate phi and its time derivative. The calculations from before repeat very similarly. Unlike the free fall example, it is not possible to describe the motion of the pendulum by elementary functions that are taught in school. On the other hand, an explicit solution is not necessary to simulate the process. In the same way, roots of equations are often only found numerically, the motion of the pendulum can be approximated numerically. The key idea is that the time evolution is broken up into finite steps. For concreteness, let's choose a step size of one tenth of a second. Instead of a continuous evolution of time, we now count steps. At the step zero, the initial conditions are imposed. In our case, the initial angle of rotation. We further assume that the pendulum starts at rest, with no initial angular velocity. Very importantly, the angular acceleration at the time zero can be calculated from the equation of motion. Next, we have to remember that the first derivative can be approximated by the slope between two nearby points by evaluating the change in the function value divided by the step size delta t. This approximation can be rearranged to obtain an expression for the angle and the velocity at the next time step, which in turn allows to calculate the acceleration at the next time step. When the angle, the angular velocity and the acceleration are known at a given point in time, all three quantities can be determined for the next point in time. This can be iterated to calculate the motion for an arbitrary length in time. Since we are working with an approximation, errors are introduced and they can accumulate, as can be seen nicely in this example. The angle should not drop below negative 0.5. When the step size is reduced, the arrow also shrinks and the numerical solution improves. With a little bit of luck, arrows cancel partially and the numerical solution stays reliable for a long time of evolution. Last but not least, we calculate the action and the equations of motion for the double pendulum. The coupling between the upper and the lower pendulum is introduced through the kinetic energy. Very generically, the kinetic energy depends quadratically on the velocity of the object. For a single pendulum, the velocity is given by the rate of change of the x and y coordinate. The two coordinates can be expressed in terms of the angle of rotation. And similarly, with the help of the chain rule, the velocity can be expressed with the rate of change of the angle phi. When the x and y components are squared and added, the dependence on the trigonometric functions vanishes and a simple looking expression for the kinetic energy is obtained. By and large, this procedure repeats for the double pendulum. Now the velocity of either pendulum contributes to the kinetic energy. For the upper pendulum, exactly the same term as before is obtained. The position for the second pendulum, however, depends on the position of the first one. The x and y coordinates are just added and re-expressed by the angles phi1 and phi2. The rate of changes are obtained accordingly. This time, the trigonometric functions do not cancel after squaring the components. It is possible to work out the result by hand, but I wouldn't blame anyone to search for help. Computer algebra software quickly does the job. It is the last term in the expression for the kinetic energy that mathematically describes the coupling between the upper and lower pendulum. Together with the simple terms for the potential energy, the Lagrangian of the double pendulum is constructed. Now it is straightforward but tedious to calculate the equations of motion. The Euler-Lagrange equations are first calculated for the variable phi1 and then for the variable phi2. Due to the interaction term, there is a mixing between the two variables. 
The acceleration, however, only appears linearly. One equation can be solved for phi 1 double dot, for instance, and plugged into the second equation to obtain an equation for phi 2 double dot only, and vice versa. And the computer almost doesn't care how long the equations are. Once they are implemented, it patiently calculates the tiny changes of the angle for every single step in time. Now we are ready to piece all parts together. The Menem software provides all the necessary tools to simulate this model of a double pendulum. In the first step, the parameters of the model and the initial conditions are declared. It is convenient to use value trackers for the time and all dynamical degrees of freedom. With the help of an updater function, the time is increased by a step size delta t, which is determined by the frame rate of the animation. The heart of the simulation consists of the implementation of the equations of motion. To shorten the expressions, the letter f is used instead of phi, and derivatives are denoted with the letter d in front of the expression. The correspondence between the last two lines of code and the equations of motion written below should be recognizable even when you are not very familiar with coding. In a third step, Euler's method is implemented with the help of updata functions. In the first line, the new value of phi1 is obtained by adding the term phi1 dot times delta t to the current value of phi1. Similar lines are written down for phi2 and the angular velocities. Also here, the correspondence to the expressions below is hopefully obvious. A rather poor animation is implemented for the sake of simplicity. You can put more efforts along the lines to make it look more appealing. The link to the source files of this video is available in the video description. And as always, let me know what you think and if you made it to this point, you might want to stay tuned for upcoming videos. Bye bye.